it's broadcasting. Well, hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to another epidose of the Ketogenic Fasting Project. My name is Tom, and uh, my uh, partner today is Bart K. We're kind of rehashing a video we did uh, previously because the video was really poor quality, and uh, we've got a few other things to say. So um, I don't know. Is it you want? Does anybody need an introduction to Bart K? I mean, you're tearing up YouTube, so I don't. Yeah, know. Tom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, thanks for that. Look, thanks very much for having me on, um, and thanks for putting aside the time to remake this video because I think that the chat we had a few weeks ago was really, really worthwhile. Um, I, I do want to make it very, very clear that I identify very clearly as part of the community of people who are on the autism spectrum in, in some form or another. Uh, I have publicly in the past said, you know, I, I am on the spectrum, I, the, the form of autism I express is called pathological demand avoidance syndrome. That makes it sound important, doesn't it? When you put the word syndrome, um, you can just call it PDA if you like. Uh, that's not public displays of affection. No, no, that's pathological demand avoidance syndrome. So that's, that's where I'm at. Um, you know, it does affect my life on a day-to-day -day basis and in, in many ways and and i guess that's what we'll be talking about today among other things um yeah but other than that no as i say thank you very much for having me i'm glad to be here i'm glad to share with um folks both autistic and otherwise and what i hope out of all of this is that at the end of the day we can understand each other just that little bit better yeah, absolutely. That's the first thing I noticed when I started doing these videos was that uh, people were were intrigued by the little peek into the world that uh, autistic people have. And of course, it's the people like ourselves that are high functioning that are able to sort of shed a little light on what's going on. And of course, there's many a people with autism that uh, really don't have the the ability to communicate very well or very effectively so i uh, was i was very encouraged when i saw people interested in uh autistic people like ourselves discussing the experience absolutely and look again thank you tom for putting me in the category of people who are high functioning um you know, <laughs> my, my my beautiful girlfriend pim would probably disagree with you um you know, just about every day, at least once, she looks at me and says, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I say, PDA, PDA, that's what's wrong, PDA. Uh, We've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> so there you have it. All right. So let's get started. Why don't you just uh, give me a quick rundown of what your dietary philosophy is like? Yeah, sure, Tom. I mean, uh, basically... Uh, where I sort of start and finish really with the whole dietary thing is that my take is that what you should put into your body for sustenance, for nutrition, are those things that your body requires, those things that your body can't uh, manufacture itself. Um, so that being said, there are there are clear needs for healthy saturated animal fats there are clear needs for various forms of omega-3 sometimes called n3 um, unsaturated fatty acids um, they're a form of, of polyunsaturates um, that are required for for a whole bunch of other things uh it's very clear that you need those in the animal forms you really don't have an effective way of changing the the plant forms into animal forms at all so you need to get them from the from where they come from which is animals uh it's really really clear that whole protein is is a good thing you know it's, it's absolutely possible to get a whole protein profile on a non-animal based diet However, it's a lot harder work. There's a lot more planning and thinking involved. Um, and, and you may well struggle, actually, to get enough of the right stuff in because of the volume of food that you'd be required to consume to achieve that. Um, dairy, while some people swear by it and think it's great, especially raw dairy, hey, that's fine. If that's your opinion, fill your boots up. That's no skin off my nose. 
but actually there's no requirement in the diet in the in the diet for dairy you don't need it so why would you uh, there's nothing that you're going to find in plants that you need to thrive and survive in an ongoing way uh, you do not need um fiber in your diet that's an absolute nonsense um the vitamins and, and things that you will find in plants a are usually locked up by those plants using anti-nutrients so that you can't get at those nutrients why would the plant want to give you its nutrients for free it doesn't actually um, it wants to discourage you from bothering to try and eating it so it, it you know puts anti-nutrients in that lock those up so you can't have them um and secondly, actually, the need for those vitamins, those minerals, those those various things in the diet is actually largely hinging on you eating a plant diet that requires you to take those nutrients and to neutralize the issues caused by the intake of the plants in the first place, if that makes sense, Tom. Um, yeah. So you don't eat the plants. You don't need so much, for example, vitamin C. Um, you don't need so much vitamin A. You don't need so much vitamin E. Um and in fact, you know, you, you, A, C, and E are all completely subservable by virtue of eating a an animal-only diet. You don't need any plants for that stuff at all. Um, and they say, oh, well, there's bioflavonoids in, in, in plants. Well, absolutely. So what do they do? They help you absorb the nutrients that you don't need. Um, so good. Um, yeah, so that's, that's overall for me, it's, it's like, okay, I've taken – a look logically as far as the way my brain's wired in terms of what logic is at, at the empirical evidences at, at the the published um, thoughts around what the nutritional requirements for human beings are I've compared that to my understanding of the biological systems at play uh, you know which is con considerable I've spent my entire um, professional life working with biology and physiology and, and and human beings both living and dead actually so you know i've i've been inside i've i've opened up bodies i've pulled the guts out of them i've had a look at them i know what goes on in there um and i've dealt with living happy healthy clients and also those in need of some support uh, and do so ongoingly so you know this is an industry that i'm up to my armpits in uh, and so I'm comparing that with what the literature says about what we need. And I'm going, well, hang on, here's where the problems are. And I'm also combining that with uh, views of taking in uh, the anecdotes, basically, the anecdotal stuff from yourself, Tom, from me, from everybody else on the internet that wants to come online and say, um, you know, um, here's what I've found since going carnival. Here's what I've felt, you know, since going keto. Uh, and then the other side, of course, people saying, here's you know, what I experience on a plant-based diet, here's why I swear by a plant-based diet, et cetera, et cetera. So I've taken all of that stuff in, is what I'm saying. I'm kind of considering all the inputs. Um, I'm not focused on just what the literature says. I'm not focused on just the anecdotes. I'm not focused on just the physiology. I'm trying to put all of that stuff together and paint a picture of what, you know, at large, on the whole, with all of that stuff to hand, here's my opinion here's what i think so that's kind of my philosophy that's what i teach people um, i think people in general both autistic and otherwise tend to get really blinkered tom they, they, they go like what does the literature say what does the peer-reviewed literature say and nothing outside of that matters um, or they dismiss the literature entirely and go i'm not interested in that it's rubbish I'm only interested in the anecdotes or they go, well, okay, what does the physiology tell us and forget the rest? It's a three pong thing. You need, you need to bring all these threads in. Um, and then you can even start thinking about things like the sociology, um, the, the way that society has developed um, and all of those kind of things to really paint a much richer picture of um, what it is that we really do need and what we really don't need. So I guess that's the overarching um idea long-winded answer i know tom but there you go <laughs> well you know that's the beauty of uh today is we could have these very long uh sort of conversations you know they're they're long format instead of just a sound bite i think we're all kind mm. of 
burned out on bumper stickers and sound bites. You know, we want to we want to understand things in depth. You know, oh, no, and I no, think no, that's sure. Tom, lacking. Tom, Tom, surely, surely, Joel Kahn can tell you everything you need to know in a three minute video. <laughs> yes, surely. he can. Fuck me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I know a, a number of your viewers would have been following, you know, that drama over the week that's been. That was fun. Um, anyway, yeah. we'll move on. We'll talk about something other than that. But You know, I heard something interesting today just just by a chance. You know, we talk about how nutritionally dense meat is compared to mm -hmm. plant-based foods and how some of the vitamins and stuff like that in the plants um, – are not quite as good or not as easy to convert into something usable. And I, I often tell the story that when I was an infant, my mother said that uh, she fed me so many strained carrots that I turned orange. And of course the natural assumption was, well, just ate too many and you know, you, you turned orange from eating too many. But I believe it was uh, Joe Rogan and Chris Kresser were talking and they were saying that could actually just be a sign that person some people don't convert the uh i forget was a retinol or something they don't they don't convert it readily and then they get that orange tinge to their skin so yeah yep absolutely yep i've heard that one as well and um and indeed seen one or two examples of it where someone has eaten um a shit ton of carrots for example or you know a whole bunch of beet or, or whatever it is that contain various forms of, of carotenoids, um, which for those that don't know, carotenoids are a precursor to retinol, which is otherwise known as vitamin A. Um, vitamin A is a required nutrient in human beings at very, very low levels, actually much lower than the RDIs would have you believe. Uh, again, for those that don't know, the RDIs are a bunch of numbers which are formed here's how they do it they get a bunch of people who are so-called expert in an area of science they call them together to form a committee they have discussions they thrash it out amongst themselves and decide what the number is and then they write that number down on a piece of paper right there's no no experimental science involved at all yeah it's what they're doing is trying to pull threads together from observations they're trying to um, bring all the theories as they are understood to bear. They, yeah. So that basically what I'm saying is they come up with a number that they arbitrarily pull out of an orifice and say, here is the number that you should take for vitamin A. Okay. And as it turns out, all of the RDIs are all overstated, vastly, vastly overstated in terms of what the actual biological requirement for the maintenance of health long-term are. So, yes, you do need vitamin A, but you need it in very, very low amounts. And indeed, if you have too much vitamin A in your system, that can actually have a toxic effect. Vitamin A is quite toxic when it's above the, the as I say, the very remarkably low level that you actually do require. It's very much a J-shaped curve, shall we say. Mm. Um, Pro-retinol A or beta-carotene or alpha-carotene, whatever it is, the, whichever form of the carotene it is, is a precursor to that vitamin A, but it, you can store it in your in your in your body, and it's not toxic, so that's it's a good storage form for it. And and what will happen in in most people is that you'll have an amount of uh, beta carotene stored in your body. It's a very low amount, but you'll have some. And if your actual vitamin A level drops below what you need, then your body will kick into action and start to convert some of the beta carotenes into um, the active vitamin form, the retinol form. Um, but what Tom is saying quite rightly is that there seems to be a fairly large proportion of the population who have a genetic, what's called a SNP basically, which is a, uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism for those that want the actual terminology. It's a piece of DNA that's knocked out. It's become uh, mutated in such ways that it doesn't actually work to do that thing. And so those people actually can't uh, convert beta carotene into retinol, into vitamin A. And so it just builds up and builds up and they start to get orange under their skin and orange fat cells and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and I have seen 
two or three different uh, examples of that in two or three different individuals. Um, when I used to work at the University of Auckland here in New Zealand, I worked for a while in a lab and the lab was dealing with basically the bodies of people who had, who had passed on and left their bodies to science. Mm. And uh, part of that job was to prepare those uh, individuals so that they could uh, be kept for a period of time and so they could be used to teach the medical students uh, and others, you know, about the physiology and about the anatomy and things. And yeah, like uh, these these bodies would come in and, and you'd look at them and you'd go, has this one been embalmed already? Because when you get embalmed, the, the, the tissues take on the colour of the embalming fluid mm. and the two, the two classic colours are pink and orange for the two different forms of embalming fluid that's typically used, at least here in New Zealand. And, you know, I'd, I'd be looking at my superior at the time saying, has this one already been done, you know? And um, obviously the answer came back, no, these are, these are fresh in. So, well, this one's orange. <laughs> and it's like, ah, oh, okay, so there we go. We've got a, we've got someone who can't convert the beta carotene into into retinol. So there you go. I mean, it, it's a real thing. It's, 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 it's not common, but it does happen. And, you know, I've seen it a couple of times. So there you go. Well, I guess we kind of see that in the the fat of the grass-fed animals, particularly the older mm. ones. They tend yeah. to be, be yellow or orangey for eating lots of grass, I guess. Yes, absolutely. And that's one of the ways I, I tell people to distinguish between good grass-raised, grass-finished meat and grain-fed meat. If, if you if you pick up a, a piece of meat in the in the supermarket there, and they're usually in those black polystyrene trays with the plastic over them, aren't they? And you look mm -hmm. at it, and you look at the fat around the meat, if it's white, that's grain-fed, most likely. Decent grass-fed um, meat, like your steaks and whatever else, that you'll see that, that the, the fat is quite clearly off-white. It's quite clearly yellow or almost greenish sometimes. And that's that's the you know that's the sign. Yep, that's grass fed. That's what you want. The white fat's the stuff that um, is usually grain fed. We don't have that problem so much here in New Zealand. All our meat down here is all grass fed all year round. Um, we are a, quite a deal closer to the equator, I guess, than you are up there in the states and Canada and and, and those kind of things. And certainly in the UK and large parts of Europe as well. So um, I mean, if you draw a line straight through the earth. Um, from where we are here in New Zealand, um, from Auckland, uh, which is some you know thousand kilometres or so, I think north of where I am here in New Zealand. But so mm. Auckland is quite far north. Anyway, you draw a line through Auckland, through the core of the earth, and come out the other side, and you're kind of somewhere around about southern Spain is where that comes mm. out. So yeah, that's gotcha. kind of where, where we're at. So we have. We have grass-fed meat all year round. We don't keep animals inside over winter. It doesn't get that cold. Grass grows all year round, so not a problem. Um, so basically, at the end of the day, that's what you all need to do. You all need to pack up and come to New Zealand. Mm. Yeah, you know, that's uh, that's not an uncommon theme. In fact, I've got a friend who's retiring down there. His, uh, he's already got uh, – his kids already live there, so mm. – it's awesome. Get here if you can. You know, if, I mean, uh, actually, like most places in the world now, there's kind of moved to start restricting the amount of, you know, of, of people that can come in, um, mm. which, you know, is understandable, I guess. What with the, the world population growing out of control and um, the damage that overpopulation does and things. I mean, what we have here really is a, uh, it's, we're not unpolluted. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we're perfect down here. There is pollution here. There are problems here with, with that kind of thing. But it's much better, I think, than many other parts in the world. We are sort of thought of as clean and green down here. We have a land mass that is the same size as the UK, give or take. Uh, but we have, I think it's about 5 million people that live here, total. Mm. Uh, and two million of those live in Auckland. So what we basically have is completely empty space for most of the country, really. Uh, to give you an idea, there are sort of 68 million people, I think, in the UK for the same landmass, and we've got five. Wow. So we, we win, basically. Yay for us. Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I live in California, and I think we've got over 30 million people just in this one state. So Yeah, so that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I can't even even relate to that 
Um, well, I, you know, I think about moving all the time because of traffic. This morning, I went to actually go get one of those uh, heart scans to get a calcium heart score. You cool, know, cool. and uh, I, it, I had a thirty-mile drive, and uh, I checked traffic. It said it would take me an hour and four minutes, right. and it took took me an extra forty-seven minutes to get to the freeway. Right, uh, crazy. I, I gave myself an hour and a half, and I was still ten minutes late to go thirty yeah. miles. So oh, that's what yeah. happened. <laughs> what is that even? I don't. Know. Hey, so did they give you the results of that fairly quickly, or how long do you have to wait to? I got a week to. Okay. I'll get a report, and I I ponied up a few extra bucks, and I got the full body scan. So oh. I got a brain scan, all the organ scan, plus the. Uh, the calcium heart score. So cool. Awesome. Let us know how it goes. That's always fascinating stuff there. Yeah. Fascinating. So I haven't had any good radiation in a while, so I figured it was time. Awesome. So why don't you tell us about your experience with autism? Sure. So, I mean, really, I, I came to the, the realization very, very late relatively that indeed that was what was going on for me. The reasons why it was kind of missed, why it didn't come up, were there were several things going on. First of all, the genetic link to autism in my family is on my father's side. And my mother, until about 18 months ago, was quite convinced, quite happy that I was not related to my father um, and so it being a genetic thing it, the, the, you know, it wasn't it wasn't something that we considered um, was I always a bit for want of a better term strange yes you bet but I lived and grew up in a household in a family where my father was autistic my brother was absolutely and is absolutely clearly touched with the brush my sister as well less obviously so but you'd go ah oh, yep if you if you knew about it you'd you'd go mm, yep okay there you go there's some stuff going on there that makes that pretty clear however uh, my kind of personality structure was considered to be because i had grown up in that household and it kind of some of it had rubbed off rather than that there was any genetic backing or reasoning why I would actually be expressing any kind of autism. Therefore, it was my own damn fault, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I had to take responsibility and I was, I was considered to be, you know, um, someone who was acting the way that I acted and, and reacting the way that I reacted to people because of socialisation more than because of an actual hardwiring issue. Mm. Um, my father was estranged from his family at large, um, years actually before I was born and he never spoke to them again. Uh, he passed away in 1987 mm. and only about 18 months ago, I received a, a Facebook message from someone I, I didn't know from a bar of soap i didn't know who they were or whatever and i sort of accepted their request and said okay you know um you know thanks for your friend request who is it that you are and and you know what is your interest and in, you know that kind of you know the, the basic you know sort of you know nice to meet you and you know what have we got in common what should we talk about sort of thing and she came straight out and she said are you is this your is this your full name is this the name of your older brother? Is this the name of your younger sister? Are these your parents' names? And I'm like, um, yeah, can I help you? And she said, well, I'm actually related to your mother on another arm of the family. I've never met your mother, but we are related. Here's what the relationship is. And I went, okay, yep, I understand that. I, I know those people. I get, I get that you're connected to my mother. Great. And she said, I'm not actually here to talk about your mother, though. I'm here to talk about your father because I've had an email from a lass in Australia who claims to be related to your father and she wants to contact you. And I'm like, hey, that's fine. It's because my father was Australian. 
sorry about that, boys and girls. That's just the way it is. <laughs> um, for those that don't understand the whole thing there, there is some niggle between Australians and New Zealanders. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it, it goes back a long way, of course. A lot of people think it just goes back to some unsporting underarm bowling in a cricket match in 1982 or something. No, it goes back further than that. Uh, there is there is animosity between, you know, it's all good. It's all good human stuff. It's much like the whole uh, English versus the Scots thing, um, you know. Anyway, uh, it turns out I'm half and half. I've got a foot in each camp. So, yeah, there you go. That's the way it is. Anyway, this uh, I was put in contact with this lass. And as it turns out, look, she showed me a photo of herself and she had a photo of my father and she had a photo you know, side by side comparison and i went absolutely there's no question you're related to him um at that time it was my opinion that i wasn't biologically related to him and i was keep, kind of keeping that to myself i wasn't saying anything much about that um because neither my brother or sister would be able to engage with that discussion anyway because they are both clearly very autistic and neither one of them wants to have anything to do with that uh, so anyway, we, we, we went through and we found out this and that and the other thing. And as it turns out, we started sharing stories and, and, and even, it sounds crazy, but photos of various body parts. Nothing dodgy, but um, things like, you know, earlobe constructions, uh, jaw lines, those kind of things. And as it turns out, I have a conjoinment of my second and third toes on both feet, which goes up to the first knuckle of those two feet. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah, so I've got this kind of, you know, doo -doo -doo, this thing. Um, oh, no. There it is. Wow, look at that. Okay. So that's what I've got going on there. And this lass in Australia, same <laughs> fucking thing. Same thing. Now, I went and did some research, okay, how common is this in the general population? It's about one in 5,000. So it is possible that it's it's a it's a, a coincidence. Mm. But anyway, at this point, I go back to my mum and say, um, Mum, can we just go through your math here again? Can we just have another look at this sort of thing? Because the other thing that is quite clear is as I age past 40, and I'm now 47, more and more and more I start to clearly resemble my father, Tom. And it's like, okay, there's a resemblance, the toe thing's going on. You look at the, the earlobe construction of this girl in Australia who's my relative. You could be looking at my sister's earlobe same deal um so i'm not just a strange difficult son of a bitch i actually am related to these people and so it now becomes a real possibility that there actually is some autism there is a hard wiring issue i'm not it's not just socialization there you know something real is going on here anywho that's how all of that developed and I think I read something about that toe thing. Isn't that uh, one of those platypus genes that was uh, crispered in by aliens or something? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. You got it. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I also have poisonous spines that grow out of my uh, elbows, like male platypuses have. Is it platypuses or platypi? Mm. Whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the yeah, I also have been known to go in the stream and the, you know. <laughs> oh boy it's always fun talking to you tom <laughs> anywho so it, it turns out uh, like and then my um girlfriend pim who i'm sure all of you have, have now become aware of because she's appeared on my channel a few times and yes i am more more uh more regularly as well my hot swedish girlfriend she started doing some research into various forms of autism and she found one called PDA, Pathological Demand Avoidance. And she said to me, whoever wrote this description of PDA obviously knows you intimately. This is written about you. And so I read through it and went, yep, that's me, absolutely. And, and so then I went and got a professional opinion on it and I went, yeah, that's what it is. We're not going to do anything about it because there's nothing that, we can do it's not something that is um amendable it's hard wiring it's how you are it's how your brain is 
it's genetically predetermined in that in that sense. Um, we we can help children with PDA to develop along slightly different lines than they otherwise would lift to their own devices. In your case, my case, that boat has considerably sailed, obviously. So they kind of said, congratulations, you now understand your whole life. And I'm like, well, thanks very much. And then I go back to my, as it turns out, niece in Australia, not the same girl, a different girl in the family who has a slightly different form of autism to the rest of the, the rest of them. And it turns out she has PDA. <laughs> and her father was my father's son from a previous marriage. So her father was, was my half-brother. He's now passed as well. Um, he died at 39, actually, from a massive um, heart attack, which also runs through my family. So there you go. Mm. Anywho, so that, that paints the whole picture. That's how that all came to light. That's how I came to understand, yes, I really am related to this. It's real. It's hardwired. Um, and now hopefully my mother can stop saying, you know, this is your own decision because you're not related to it. <laughs> I get stuff, Mum. <laughs> well, uh, next time you're in SoCal, maybe we can uh, go uh, get heart scans together. It sounds like you need one worse than I do. Yeah, I actually had one. Uh, I had one huh. uh, to, to do about two years ago now, give or take. Um, I think she thinks just about snack on two years ago. Yeah, just about. What happened was my older fall brother who I'd always considered to be my half-brother, that turns out we're actually fully related, um, he had a massive coronary event wow. uh, at age 48, he was at the time. He'll be 50 this year. Mm. Um, and, you know, it nearly killed him. As wow. I say, our half-brother died at 39. It runs right through the family. Um, my father died at 52 all you know congenital heart disease um acquired heart disease on top of that uh and so my brother had a major event and so i went oh shit i need to go and find out whether i've got the same congenital malformation of the tricuspid valve that they all have turns out i got away with it i have a perfectly normal tricuspid and my mm. heart health is as good if not better than anybody else in the family actually because i've had a lifelong a love of sport and, and being physically active and I've been involved heavily at high levels of sport and I've, I've done a lot of resistance training and powerlifting you know, and indeed you know aerobic type of things as well which I now understand that you should never do but there you go um so it's yeah it's been a it's been an interesting you know couple of years in terms of growth and development and understanding of that kind of stuff mm. Were there any other aspects of uh, your autistic symptoms you didn't cover that you wanted to cover? I mean, I guess the actual symptoms themselves are, you know, very particular to my particular form of autism. They are very predictable, actually. Um, in general, I'm able to, I guess, moderate the way I interact with the world when I'm not distressed, when I'm not shall we say, malfunctioning when I'm not. You know, everybody has a limit, I guess. And and when one of the things that happens when I become too overloaded, too distressed, there's too much weight on my shoulders, or you know, however you want to look at it, then my natural tendencies, my natural unfiltered behaviours will come back to the fore and will start to rear their ugly heads. And in terms of the PDA thing, they are generally things like sudden violent temper outbursts and i mean violent temper in terms of the temperament not the activity I, i've never been a violent person i've never i've never um done anybody physical harm who um other than in self-defense is what i'm saying um i never would start anything like that even if i was angry i'm still it's not like i lose control of my um my behavior uh, physically, it's just an emotional outburst. It's a blah. And there are several hot buttons, several triggers that that if I'm under stress, that will that will precipitate that reaction. Um, one of the big ones is a perception of disrespect. If I perceive that I'm being disrespected by somebody, that often will get an angry response. That'll get 
they don't get shouting and swearing and carrying on like a like a prepubescent boy or whatever. And uh, you've probably all seen that actually on that on that Dr. Ricky thing. That we all know at the end of the day that Dr. Ricky does not exist. Well, there is someone called Dr. Ricky who actually lent his identity to this fictional character, Dr. Dr. Ricky, on on the internet. The actual character on the internet is is a character who is acted out by Isaac Brown, and he's very adept at manipulating people emotionally. And he's he found the way in on that day. Um, an actual fact, in terms of the actual debate, the actual discussion that we had, he actually had his ass handed to him, and he only gained any kind of face saving by actually purposely finding their way in to trigger that emotional response in me. Uh, and so now everybody says, oh, you know, you, you rage quit and all this kind of stuff. Actually, no, I just ended the discussion at a point where it became clear that he wasn't going to discuss the actual science with me that we needed to discuss to inform on the moot point that we were there to talk about. Um, so that's an example. Okay, so violent outbursts in terms of short words beginning with C usually um and um and you know have it you know and 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 insults and and carrying on like that um the, the thing that most people would refer to is the throwing of the toys so you know you'll get that um in a disrespect situation uh, the other one that's a big trigger that can bring the the natural unfiltered behavior to the surface is alcohol um, that's why I basically avoid alcohol largely because it's you know, me and alcohol don't mix well at all. It, it turns me into someone else. I don't like that person, so I don't usually go there. Um, basically, yeah, the PDA thing is about anytime anybody wants to impose anything upon me, okay, T to me, discipline comes from from within me, self-discipline, when I feel like doing it for reasons that are my own, great. But if somebody else wants to impose any kind of discipline on me, problem. Um, if anybody wants to tell me how to do something, problem. Um, if anybody wants to place demands upon me, you must do this, you must do that, problem. Um, yeah, that's basically how it, how it uh, how it manifests itself and so i guess you know there are there are parts of life that i've learned to sort of negotiate through and other parts not so much that i'm still working on yeah so uh do you have any aspects that diet is directly impacted as far as your autistic symptoms or <clears throat> excuse me it, it's it's hard to know for sure tom but i mean it, my my opinion is yes i think that <laughs> Excuse me. I think that when the body is in good shape physically, then the mind is in good shape physically usually as well. Um, a lot of mental illness, uh, a lot of problems with one's mental health are directly attributable to inflammation of the tissues in the brain. And if your diet is right and your your chronic systemic inflammation level is very low, then a lot of those things will evaporate. A lot of those a lot of those weights will come off one's shoulders. And I believe definitely that that I have found that I, I think it's made a massive difference to my life in terms of I have had a lifelong uh, battle with quite serious bipolar issues, depressive issues, and really also quite quite debilitating anxiety. And since going carnival, all of those all of those issues have resolved, they've all evaporated, uh, along with some physical affectations as well, like very serious fibromyalgia, that's gone. Uh, but basically every digestive disorder you could just about think of, been there, done that, got the T-shirt, been hospitalized several times with diverticulitis, pancreatitis as a very young man, well before you could blame it on any kind of alcohol intake, uh, to which, you know, the medical community just go, yeah, it's virally induced, because, you know, that's another, that's, that's their code for we have no idea. <laughs> uh, 
um, because basically their paradigm doesn't allow them to consider the possibility that it's caused by the consumption of poisonous plant matter. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, as I say, very serious fibromyalgia, like debilitating, can't get out of bed some days, stiff, you know, so stiff, couldn't move. Um, quite serious depression, very, you know, bipolar tendencies, serious anxiety. Um, yeah, all just, just gone, basically. Um, obviously, that the autism is what it is. It's a hard wiring issue. It's my personality. It's who I am. My, my path through the world, I guess, is to try and moderate myself in such a way as to be able to largely negotiate the world and get along with people in the best way that I possibly can. That's never going to change in terms of what my reptilian brain, as Pim would call it, would want to do. My, my basic behaviors, my go-to defaults, if all my filters are turned off, um, that'll never change. And my, my task as a human being, I guess, to negotiate the world is to have all my filters in play and have them all functioning effectively so that I can head myself off at the pass and behave for want of a better term in a more um, socially soothing, socially acceptable manner. Um, you can't spend your life raging, throwing your toys, screaming and calling anybody um, words beginning with C that causes you a problem. You, you have to at some point go, well, you know, and I guess that's where science came in for me as, as, as one of my great loves. It's, it's a way of focusing the argument and saying, well, okay, great. Now let's look at what science tells us. Um, of course, I'm not so naive and stupid as many people are to believe that science is the be all and end all and the answer to everything and can't be, can't be discredited. You know, if I put on a white coat and hang a stethoscope around my neck, does that make me right? Well, no. Um, so yeah, I guess again, I know a very long winded, a long winded answer, but that's kind of, uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to do with all these things is to, to give you the full picture if I can. So, sure. you know, that's, that's where it is, I think. Yeah. I noticed a drastic reduction in anxiety myself and it seems to continue to get better. Um, and then, you know, I periodically see these studies they do where they've actually used a uh, ketogenic type diet um, with patients who are schizophrenic and it okay. seems to improve their, uh, their schizophrenic symptoms. So mm, mm. cool. They have quite a number of people in the carnivore uh, arena report a decreased uh, depression as well. Of course, depression seems to be more prevalent even than anxiety but of course anxiety mm -hmm. seems to be very prevalent with people who have some sort of uh, autism and uh, oftentimes that's accompanied with um with with the anxiety as well or the anxiety and the depression come mm -hmm. coupled together right yeah i mean i i i think anxiety is 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 a close cousin is closely akin to obsessive compulsive disorder as well i mean it's it's a feeling of compulsion that you have to be a certain way react a certain way do certain things um again they i think they're quite quite closely tied up as well and i've certainly have heard of folks with various forms of of ocd that have that have seen you know quite real improvements in their own ability to negotiate the world uh, purely from dropping the pro-inflammatory poisonous um non-food items from their from their uh, from their intakes uh and for those that don't get immediately what i mean there when i say non-food what i mean is plants plants are not food for human beings not at right all. there are foods food <laughs> yeah yeah so, so did you have any other uh symptoms like uh, digestive issues or Oh God, where do I start, Tom? Jeez, yes, I've you know as as a very young man, like uh, seventeen or eighteen years old, I had a period of hospitalization with pancreatitis, which is normally a disease that you see in lifelong alcoholics who have been alcoholics for decades. 
Um, it's an inflammation of the pancreas. It's um, it can be life threatening. It's it's a very very serious illness. Um, obviously, you know, in my case, they, they there wasn't the history there, so they said, oh well, it was virally induced, and um, it it settled once. I mean, they put me on an elimination diet, basically, because I thought, okay, the only thing we can think of is it might be something and, you know, you might be an autoimmune dysfunction. So I went on an elimination diet, which obviously largely eliminated a lot of the poisonous plants. And it came right. Oh, here you go. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, that was, you know, years before I came to the realization that plants are not food. Um, and, of course, I went straight back to my normal diet of, you know, the normal nonsense and... Um, and the pancreatitis never flared up again, but boy, I suffered in other ways. I had uh, diverticulosis, diverticulitis at one point. I was in hospital for that for a while. Um, I've had a couple of uh, um, episodes of being hop hospitalized for nothing more than basically quite serious um, depression where the belief was I was a risk to myself. Um, I'm not sure I ever really was, but there you go. Um, I'm too bloody stubborn, actually, to <laughs> to consider, you know, choosing the out, I guess. Um, what else? Uh, I'm definitely clearly gluten intolerant. Um, mm -hmm. Anytime I consume any significant amount of gluten, there's a problem the next day. Um, I, I, I don't want to get into too much detail, but... Those of you that know what that one's about know exactly what I'm talking about. Hmm. Um, you know, I drank the uh, barium contrast solution yep. for the scan today, and it was very sweet. So I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, that it was glucose-based or something like that. Yeah, and, I think it is. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't had a dose of sugar like that in a long time, and I didn't really notice anything until I went to the gym later, and I was doing squats. And all of a sudden, man, I was just out of steam. I was like, what's going on? And sugar then I, you know, I was mm. like, wow, God, that uh, sugar, it burned off. And I was, my tank was empty. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's the one. Um, oh God, I, 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 I have a long history of just, just hundreds of, probably of different digestive disorders and things i what i really should do is go look through my medical records to to be able to to catalog them for you tom but i, I you know isn't it interesting how how all these digestive issues have kind of been normalized you know it's like i used to get a heartburn all the time when i you know my from the time i was a kid until i started on uh ketogenic diet and uh then occasionally on the ketogenic diet i'd get it but when I was a kid, and I'd say, oh, I got heartburn, I'm like, it just about everybody said, yeah, I get that too, you know, take this. Yep, take there's that. one I've had heartburn all my life until I went carnivore. Yep, there's another one. Yeah. Not to mention just all the general sort of, ah, oh, your stomach's rumbling, things are a little off, you know. And everybody kind of, kind of, you know, gave me the impression anyways when I, when I mentioned these things, oh, that's normal, you know, if it gets – it's bad enough and, and of course a lot of people take you know uh acid blockers or proton inhibitors and i've noticed uh quite a quite a that that exposes people to getting pneumonia you know yeah. so um i don't know some ridiculous number like you're 20 times more likely to get pneumonia if you take something like that and i don't think people realize it and they hand it out like candy here yeah. you know and it, uh, microbrews are really popular here i don't know about everywhere else and i noticed that the people that drink a lot of beer but particularly craft brew and stuff like that they have a tendency to get heartburn yeah you know and then mm. they get on the the acid blocker the proton inhibitor and the next thing next thing you know a year later they got pneumonia it's crazy yeah, yeah. There, there's a whole bunch of other problems with, with proton pump inhibitors as well um Perhaps we'll talk about that another day, Tom. But uh, I, I mean, the short and skinny for me on that is I wouldn't touch. Like I have been on them myself. I have done that um, in the past. But knowing what I now understand about them, I wouldn't touch them with a barge pole. I wouldn't go anywhere near those PPI drugs, the imiprazoles and those kinds of drugs that 
that purport to be, you know, the blockers of the of the acid forming in the stomach. Um, basically, what what people need to understand is that any time you interfere with your body's natural design, it will try and counteract the change that you're making. Your, your body has a design; it, it works according to instructions laid down in your DNA, and the proton pumps, for want of a better term, that are in your stomach, lining the wall of your stomach there. If you put a drug into your body that downregulates their activity, slows them down, your body will respond to that by turning on the switch on the gene that encodes for the production of more of those things because your rate of acid production has now gone down. Mm. And so your body actually... Now that you've done that, I'm going to turn that switch on and we're going to make more of these things. So actually what happens over a period of time when you take proton pump inhibitor drugs is that causes your stomach lining to express more of those pumps to counteract the effect of the drug that you've been taking. As it turns out, the indication, the time span that you are supposed to be prescribed and given proton pump inhibitor drugs it's different from country to country, but I, I may be, I may have this wrong, but I, from memory in New Zealand, I think it's 28 days. This is the longest period of time that any physician is supposed to prescribe PPI drugs to a patient for. After that, they're supposed to find another solution. But mm. you'll find people who are prescribed proton pump inhibitors on repeat, on repeat, on repeat for years. For years, Tom. It's disgraceful. Yeah. I'm not that's surprised. Not, that is off license use of that drug. Okay. The doctor that signs that prescription or signs that repeat prescription actually puts himself in a position of being at, you know, in malpractice, depending on the law in the country concerned, obviously. But it's very, very dangerous. Well, we have a handful of them now that are available over the counter here. So you don't even need a script. So you could imagine oh, how much people take. My God. Really? Yeah. Woo. Well, you know, I, I look at it this way. You know, you, if in my case, like I've got, I've still got active psoriasis. I don't know if you can see that, but oh, yeah. that ugliness. But, uh, you know, a lot of people take the biologics for that. And I'm like, well, like I, I just recently uh, um, signed up to consult with uh, the, the doctors in Hungary at the uh, paleo medicina about this because this is the, my only symptom that hasn't resolved and I was making the argument with people that you know I don't really want to try the biologics because uh, they basically just suppress your immune system right yeah, yeah. what is that Absolutely. a good idea no and there's a couple of people in uh, some of the groups I, I've been thrown out of all the psoriasis groups on Facebook so but uh, there's a couple You're of people in there had boy. <laughs> they had to have liver transplants after their second dose of biologic. I'm like, yeah, I think I'd rather save my liver for something else, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. And wow. it's the same story with the with the um, you know the Lipitor and all the other statins. It's like you're really interfering with liver function. You know, you're taking a drug that's re reducing cholesterol production in the liver, but it's not just reducing uh, cholesterol production, is it? It's it's uh, so far up that the, the way the mechanism works, it's so far up the chain. It's also eliminating the, the production of other needed uh, components, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. It's, it's you know, I've, I've said it a hundred times and I'll never get sick of it until this drug is withdrawn. Basically, it is a dangerous, contraindicated metabolic poison with no indication and I mean no indication, okay? There is absolutely no excuse for peddling this garbage, this poison on the population. There will be major lawsuits in future. There will be multi-billion and probably multi-trillion dollar lawsuits that will be uh, leveled against the companies that have peddled this garbage for the last 50 years or however long it's been, the statins have been available. There's well, no you know, the heart scan here, 
uh, it's about 150 bucks. In other parts of the U.S., it's only a hundred dollars. Mm. And I'm sure the cost of uh, being on statins is has got to be close to that, if not more, in a year or two. And they put these yeah. they put people on that for the rest of their life. And it's like, well, man, if you want to know whether to take that statin or not, and of course, you know, you hear people complain about them. You know, the muscle aches and you know, eventually there's a decline in cognitive abilities and stuff yeah. like that. And it's like, well, you just throw down 150 bucks and see if you've got any calcified plaque in your arteries. You know, why not? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. You bet. You bet. Um, I, w- I would sooner have a few reds of radiation on one day, um, which is really not much more serious than your average X-ray t- through your chest, to be fair. Um yeah, I think it's uh, one millisiever as oh, a standard okay. dose, you know. Yeah. Whatevs. You probably get more than that from a 5G tower if it's anywhere near your house. <laughs> probably, you probably get more than that from TSA when you get on the airplane. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. And then, you, and then you fly, you know, some some far off place like New Zealand and you're up there and 30,000 feet, you're, you're getting a big dose there too, right? Yep, for sure, for sure. Oh boy! So, what other kind of results have you seen in other people switching to this diet? I mean, the the anecdotes I, I hear are usually along sort of very similar lines. I mean, basically, we have, in my opinion, an absolute pandemic in our society of disordered metabolism, disordered um, gut function. Um, we have a slew of disease processes which are all directly attributable cause and effect to chronic systemic inflammation. Um, basically, uh, almost, almost without exception, the woes of our modern society health-wise are all down to poisoning ourselves with inappropriate non-food items in our intakes um at the end of the day plants do not exist on this planet to provide food for human beings or you know or or anybody else actually uh, other than herbivores we are not herbivores Uh, even less are we fruitarians that's just absolutely ridiculous we are hunter gatherer opportunistic predator slash scavengers um our genetic programming our genetic background is uh, is very much along those lines excuse the sun there on my face it's quite nice though (laughs) um you know it's uh, and what we find is that when we can when someone's heart and mind is ready and they're and they're they are prepared to accept that everything they've been taught by the powers that be, the so-called authorities, the people with the so-called knowledge, everything they've been taught their whole life is wrong and they believe us and they try, they just accept what we say and go, okay, I will believe you, I will try this for four weeks, 28 days and see what happens. I have never seen anybody ever go back to eating plants again. As a, as a generalized rule. They might still sneak the odd thing in there because we're all human beings, absolutely. We are all um, genetically programmed and, and socialized to be opportunistic scavengers and to... It's that thing when you go to the, you go to that party and there's that f- table of nonsense junk f- so-called food on the table and, the, and our brains are going, there's food there, I've got to have it. <laughs> it's there. I must, yeah. you know, I must take advantage of this opportunity to put food into my body, even though it's not even remotely close to food. It's nonsense. It's garbage. But it, it's that whole, there is caloric energy here. I will I will take it because that's, that's how, you know, I have evolved as such. Um, you know, and... and the damage that we do to ourselves by by basically um, designing things 
manufacturing things that were never meant to be food for humans whatsoever and putting that into our body that's that's what's doing all this damage so as i say you know i, I have never come across someone who has genuinely applied themselves for four weeks to a carnivorous um, animal food only nutritional program who's ever gone back uh, mainly because basically uh, things that were going wrong for them in their health they might not have even been aware of because sure. they just thought that's, that's normal that's life right. i mean i remember my grandmother bless her soul used to say in this life son we suffer pain and over the road they will suffer the same it was expected and normal um and it was almost a badge of honor to be you know full of gout and diabetes and fatness and unhappiness and all that kind of stuff that's what it is you know suck it up well no that's not what it is what what that is is a clear sign we are doing this wrong you are not biologically designed to be a fatty you are not biologically de designed to develop diabetes heart disease anxiety depression psoriasis um any of us arthritis absolutely you know all of these things are all diseases of modern society and they are all born of putting poisonous contraindicated non-food into our bodies because the powers that be have taken it upon themselves to form an opinion that the intake of plants is healthy and indicated and the intake of animal protein and animal fat is contraindicated and unhealthy without backing that up with any form of science whatsoever. You know, um, here in the States, we, we had these commercials with an actor named Wilford Brimley. Ah, uh, yes, to, with the diabetes. <laughs> well, he, he used to sell uh, oatmeal, you know, yep. it's so uh, they'd huck these oatmeals to tell you how, how healthy they are. And, and of course now he he's hucking diabetes supplies. And I was reading an article the other day that even horses get diabetes from eating too many oats, you yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> they're meant to eat plants, you know, they're, they're herbivores, but, but even the horses will get diabetes. So imagine what it could do to a human being. Well, we don't need to imagine it. Do we, Tom? We <laughs> no, we it. don't. <laughs> time and again just look at the stats just look at the numbers you know I, I i just it it blows my fragile mind to think about this and to and to I, I cannot understand how any rationally thinking remotely logical human being could place any trust whatsoever in the medical establishment the powers that be the so-called nutritional authorities, the ADA, all these kind of organizations, let's look at their track record. Let's look at the stats. Let's look at the results that they have managed to achieve in the population who, you know, I've seen various studies that say, yeah, people are generally following these guidelines. Um, you know, people are generally basing their diets on 65% uh, complex carbohydrates they are generally avoiding saturated animal fats they are generally avoiding red meats and especially processed uh, they are making sure they have five plus servings of fruit and vegetables a day they are getting their fiber and they are being a good boy and a good girl they're doing what they're supposed to do according to these authorities that in mind let's look at the let's look at the health stats let's see what's going on with people's health whoops is that netting a benefit? No, sir. People are dying early in their millions because they're following this ridiculous advice. Yeah. Yeah, I only, live, I only live about 20 miles from Loma Linda, and that's the center for uh, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, you know, shit. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. those people all around you know i uh and uh i you know now i realize it's this weird sort of uh christian offset offshoot and yeah. their prophet was this girl who got hit in the face of the rock and started having these visions about how we're supposed to be vegetarians 
Yeah. And of course, it's people from that group that uh, went on to establish the American Dietetics Association. Yep. I know they. Uh, I know they have a large presence in Australia as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know that they uh, were very instrumental in bringing the soy crops uh, to uh, commercial levels, both in the U.S. and other countries. Yep. You know, and a lot of the. Uh, the dogma about vegetarianism and not eating meat really does stem from them. And they're not really all that secretive about it. They're just not real in your face about it. And I think mm -hmm. people don't realize that, you know, these people had a essentially a religious agenda provided to them by a woman who was struck in the face by a rock and supposedly became a prophet. You know, that's some, that's some pretty far out woo woo stuff, you know? Mm. Mm. Although that's not actually a lot less complex than a lot of the so-called science that we're told is, is out there at the moment, Tom. So, <laughs> you know, it's as good as anything else. Well, uh, you know, I went to I went to school at a, a, a university called uh, um, Cal Poly Pomona, and that school was where the land and everything is provided by the Kellogg family. Oh, shit. So, okay. so, so when I lived there, uh, you know, you'd go in the cafeteria and there's all this cereal all the cereal, you, more cereal than you could imagine <laughs> in one place, mm. you know. And then you, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie Road to Wellville with yeah. Anthony Hopkins, you know. And you're like, wow, these people really were into. And of course, uh, Dr. Kellogg, he was a typesetter for the Seventh Day Adventists when they were start, first started publishing. So he was indoctrinated as a young man, and then he got this idea that we've got to. We've got to flatulate more and and have less intercourse. And you know, if we put people on these high carbohydrate diets, they won't have these evil thoughts. And yeah. you know, and on. wasn't he the one that said that you shouldn't interfere with yourself? Wasn't that him? What's that? Wasn't he the one that said you shouldn't interfere with yourself? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He had these sanitariums and stuff where people went and they ate these plant based diets. And yeah, you know, of course, that was at the time of consumption so you know there's don't eat animals and no wanking yeah <laughs> god forbid wow eat these corn flakes. <laughs> they grow a lot of corn around here i've never seen a flake on a corn cob have you no no nope. it's like trying to find the nugget on the chicken yeah well jesus <laughs> so what are you eating a typical day Okay, so a typical days and takes for me uh, generally meat of some kind. Um, I I'm a once a day eater, uh, not because I've made a decision to eat once a day or that I follow an OMAD lifestyle or, or ideology. Purely, I eat once a day because I'm hungry once a day. Um, you could say you've conditioned yourself to be so. Sure, if you like, that's fine. Generally, I'm hungry around about the time that the sun's starting to set in the evening. Uh, so at that time, I'll, I'll sit down to a meal of uh, steak or, or ground beef of some kind or fish or ch uh, chicken. I've got nothing against chicken. Um, pork actually is quite quite big in my diet as well, either bacon or pork chops or, you know, pork belly is a good one. Um you and just then kind of eat till you're, till, till you're satisfied. It's a, yeah, I, I, I don't count macros. I don't count micros. I don't have a program that tells me that I've met all my requirements for the day. I'm a good boy. Um, what I do is I eat until my body tells me that it doesn't want any more food. And then I stop eating pretty much. Um, special occasions. Obviously, there are transgressions that occur. You know, the odd plant-based thing will sneak in there. Um in terms of like chronic plant-based intakes that still go on with me, I still drink a lot of coffee. I'm working on that yeah. actually. I'm, I'm looking at getting rid of that because it's 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 at a level where, I mean, this is my coffee cup here, and I would have at least six of these a day with um, cream and a little bit of stevia. Mm. Uh, okay, you, you, you might be drinking right? more coffee than me. Uh, well, I, I think I, you know, I, I probably my coffee intake is, is over the top. I certainly Pim tells me she thinks it is. Um, so, you know, that's something I'm looking at, at reducing in the, in the next phase of things. Um, 
but yeah largely that's it it's 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 one meal a day of, of some kind of meat based meat based foodies um hello professor fluffy would you say hello to the boys and girls for those that haven't met professor fluffy before she's my peer reviewer she makes mm. sure that i don't tell any lies to the boys and girls online mm. don't you fluffy She's also a, an opportunistic um, character. Like that's, that's why I love her so much because I, I understand her psychology. Don't I, Fluffy? I've got a I've got a dog right here at my side wanting attention as well. So yeah. Well, this is not really a dog. This is kind of like a dog, only smaller. Mm. Um, and she's six years old. This is her. This is her entire. You know, that's it. <laughs> yeah. As I say, just like a dog, only smaller. That's it. Although when she gets down on the beach with all the other dogs, she will chase the big dogs and snap at their heels and tell them who's in charge. And mm -hmm. she's a terror, aren't you? I've got one of those. Mm. Charges yeah. fire trucks. Yep. Skateboards, <laughs> Rottweilers. Not There's job. no fear in one of them. Yeah. Nope. Tell you. Yeah. Okay. So, what kind of advice do you give to people when they're trying to switch to the diet? Okay, for me, like, obviously, I, you know, I'm available to folks uh, as a consultant. Um, I do have that facility available to people on my Patreon site. And also, I now have a parallel subscribe star, which I set up basically because there are some people for the obvious reason around the freedom of speech thing that I've got the nose that are joined with Patreon and won't support it. Okay, fine. I have a subscribe star as well, so you can go that way. Basically, it's, it's a $50 a month tier, which I think is remarkably cheap for what it is. Uh, what you get for that is basically up to two hours, give or take, obviously, of FaceTime with myself on Skype. And, um, and I do encourage people that that's a good thing. Um, what I basically will do is, is take, I mean, everybody's a bit different, Tom, in terms of how their psychology works in terms of what where they've come from in terms of what their upbringing has been their nutritional policies have been to date uh, there is a lot of uh, both cultural and social um, stuff to break down there before we can get to a point where people will understand the basic premise and i guess the basic premise i say to people is this the reason that you eat is so that you might live it is not the other way around. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what you put in your mouth, what you chew up and swallow, what you put into your body for nutrition should be the stuff that you require, the stuff that your body needs. And what you should avoid are those things that cause you a problem. Now, there are some things that are universally going to cause problems for people. Okay, and they are things like phytates, tannic acids, oxalates, lectins. I could go on all day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those things that you will find in plants, those things that have evolved in those plants to discourage you from eating those plants. Okay, plants did not evolve with any affection for you, Tom, or me, or any other human being, or any animal, actually. Plants evolve for their own means, for their own ends. They want to live. They want to survive. They want to procreate. They want to continue to be. That's their sole reason for being. So if animals like us are going to come along and eat them, they are going to develop means to discourage you from doing that. And they've got some pretty good ones. You know, oxalates are a doozy. They are a great poison. They are an awesome poison. They are unbelievable, actually. Go and have a look at my video where I discuss that at length with Elliot Overton. I think it's called The Best Oxalate Talk That You Will Ever See. That's available for free on my channel. Um, Elliot's an awesome, awesome resource on oxalates, uh, for example. So, um, yeah, there are some things that people are, are universally going to find problematic. And if we get rid of those things... Then what we're down to is, is sorting through what's left. Okay, do you maybe personally have an issue with um, shellfish protein? Some people do. Um, we don't need to worry about the nut allergy because that's gone because nuts are plants. 
Uh, I mean, of, of the, there are sort of five or six major common serious allergies that people will have and, uh, you know, five of them, all but one, basically, are uh, plant-based. So you get rid of that and you've actually, you're, you're five, six of the way there in terms of sorting out someone's ongoing health, really. And then it's just a matter of reassuring people. People need the reassurance. They need someone to say, you will not drop dead of a heart attack within two minutes because your cholesterol's high. In fact, the whole idea about cholesterol and heart, heart disease is absolute ridiculous pseudoscientific nonsense without any evidence behind it of any kind whatsoever, never was, never will be. That's all just an elaborate ruse pulling the wool over your eyes, trying to tell you that, you know, a substance that your body manufactures and generates according to the instructions encoded in your genes, which have been around on this planet for 3.8 billion years, selectively, you know, natural selection and all of that. Come on, are you kidding me? Your body that's been around, or the DNA in your body that's been around for nearly 4,000 million years is doing something that's going to overtly kill you? Come on. Yeah. So and it's about it's about getting through to people that they understand that the person there with the white coat and the stethoscope is telling you what they've been told to tell you. They are indoctrinated. They right. are under the control of, they are under the direct control influence of those that have a vested financial interest in lying to you about your health they have a, a vested financial interest in keeping you sick fat and behooven to them they have no interest in telling you the truth they have no interest in your in getting your health right okay the thing is if anybody in that establishment actually told you what it takes to heal your health, to heal your life, all they have done in so telling you that information is deprive themselves of a customer, a lifelong customer. They have no interest in doing that. Their interest is very clearly the opposite of that. Keeping you under their thumb, keeping you... Um, enthrall to their ridiculous pseudoscientific and wrong advice it's crazy it's criminal the the medical establishment the medical establishment is responsible directly for vastly vastly more death than hitler pol pot and all the other crazy characters that have been involved in this kind of um you know carry on throughout history yeah i think i said something like that in one of my videos i said that ansel keys had probably killed more people than you know mao and hitler oh, that question. yeah ansel keys should have spent the later part of his life in prison ansel keys was a criminal yep sad but true yep well let me set up the next question yeah, cool. the uh the the idea is that number one you've got a lot of people who who have been overweight for a long time mm. autistic individuals in, in particular are at a much higher risk of being obese yep. and uh so i'm always curious about when you have a person who's metabolism is distorted or damaged or deranged there's a lot of good names for it obviously they're not going to just uh lose a bunch of weight and have a, a normal metabolism overnight so no. i was curious as to what what sorts of uh markers people want to look at and uh, what sort of mindset they need and is it just a matter of just sticking with it year after year and it gradually gets better or yeah. what, what have you seen? Okay, so I mean, I guess what I find in that regard is that in terms of what is good nutrition for someone with autism as opposed to what is good nutrition for someone without autism, there's no differentiation, okay? The, the rules are the same. Um, 
here's another thing my grandmother used to say, which I found useful and have always remembered. And she always used to say, you cannot negotiate with the truth. You cannot negotiate with success. There are rules around how to be successful in life in, in whatever you do. And that applies as well to the nutrition as it does to anything else. So it's a matter of getting through to the autistic person that what we're talking about here is a set of rules around self-discipline. It's around getting that person to understand, be they autistic or otherwise, that actually they've been sucked in and they can assert themselves. They can show that they know better. They can take control of the situation by doing the exact opposite, pretty much, of the classic advice that people are given nutritionally. And I think that I find personally that people with autism, even more than people without, tend to gravitate to that. They tend to appreciate that. They go, ha ha, here's a way I can stick it up the man. And I, I found that to be quite effective. And uh, it's kind of almost giving those people a challenge to say, look, you know, prove me wrong. Follow my advice to the letter. And by the way, I'm going to ask you for a blood sample every month. I will know if you've cheated. There are tests that we can do that will tell me you, you, you've, you have cheated here. So you follow my advice to the letter for the next four weeks and let's see what happens. I've never had to ask for a, a second blood test. In fact, I've never had to ask for the first one. No one has ever said I have followed your advice and failed. Here is my blood test to prove I have not cheated. Nobody. Um, and because the advice I give is sound, it's based on actual physiology, it's based on actual science, it's based on actual understandings of how things work in the real world. It's not clouded by the white coat stuff. Um, and it's not clouded by finance. Sure, I charge for my advice, but that's my living. You know, I, I have to. Um, so I, mean, I guess that's how that one pans out. Um, yeah, that, that's what works. Giving people a challenge, giving them a, a, you know, giving them an opportunity to actually take the advice, follow it, and see what actually happens. Because people don't, people are not going to believe me or you, Tom, or anybody else, just because we say so, irrespective of what our our knowledge, our credentials, how many papers we've published, how many book chapters we've written. Um, how many crackpots we've pulled down with, you know, video analyses online or whatever it is, that the proof that people need to see is in the pudding, if you'll excuse the pun. And, and yeah, that's what we do. Have you ever worked with somebody that was like four or 500 pounds? And... Never anybody quite that big, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, that's big. That's That's huge. That's a big person. Um, and that's that's someone with a long way to go. Um, I, I I don't think my advice would be particularly any different in terms of okay, well here's what the nutrition requirements are ongoingly. There would be some particular things I would need to sort of think about and add into that program and things that are bespoke to someone in that situation. Um, mm, that's it's an interesting one. Yeah, as I say, no, I've never I've never dealt with anyone quite that big. It's not quite enough junk food down there in New Zealand to get people that big, huh? Oh, there is, and and there are people down here who are that big. <laughs> uh, Believe me, they do exist. Um, yeah. Well, let me set up another question for you. This really uh, revolves around my uh, pet theory. It's way out there in the weeds, and mm -hmm. uh, basically, yeah, you know, having been sort of in the middle of trying to wrap my own head around this i noticed quite a strong correlation with people with autistic symptoms are very likely to have autoimmune diseases very yep. likely to have uh digestive issues yep. and they often also have uh you know uh, emotional or psychiatric uh issues that that accompany in it and um we see this interesting phenomena where 
you can use an MRI, particularly functional MRI, to detect development, autistic development in brains and in children that aren't even born yet in utero. Well, and so we know that autism can exist at that phase. And then we also see uh, a lot of parents reporting that their children exhibit uh, uh, very strong autistic symptoms all of a sudden after being vaccinated. Yeah. So my theory is that, you know, vaccines and food don't necessarily cause autism directly, but that they they make the symptoms worse, you know, mm -hmm. just like we're seeing people changing up their diet and it, it relieving autistic symptoms or schizophrenic symptoms, symptoms of depression. And I wonder if it goes a bit beyond just inflammation, you know, if, uh, or maybe, maybe uh, the inflammation itself represses certain developments in the brain and then yeah. other parts of the brain uh, overdevelop or develop to a higher degree because they're less impacted by the, let's, let's just assume that it's a, a diet rich in carbohydrates or yeah. a, uh, a vaccine that causes uh, immune system activation. Yeah, I mean, it it's it seems to me to be very very likely that someone who is chronically inflamed does have systemic inflammation will be more likely to express the. Uh, the lizard brain presentation, the, the base, this is how my brain is wired because I have the autism thing. This reduces the ability of the brain to uh, integrate with the world that it finds itself in and, 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 and default to, to the base behavior, I guess. I'm fairly happy that that inflammation does explain it pretty well um I, I get what you're saying that your theory is that there's probably more to it than it being that simple and i'm more than happy that that's quite likely it's not something i know a lot about it's not an area i've looked at greatly i have i have some sort of uh, i guess somewhat controversial views on vaccination myself just at large um my theory is that it shouldn't be done and not for the reasons that most people think. I'm not. I'm not about conspiracy theories. I'm not about the vaccines will kill you. I'm not about. And I'm sure that there are definitely some people who have been injured or killed directly by a vaccine. They are the minority. Sure. They're not the. They're not the majority. They are the minority. Right. But it does happen. To say it doesn't is a fallacy. There are those who swear by the efficacy of vaccination in the population by way of eradicating certain illnesses and things. I think that the eradication of an illness via a program of inoculation is the exception. I don't think it's the rule. Basically, with what we are here is we are in an arms race genetically with these pathogens. We evolve, they evolve, we evolve, they evolve. The problem is they evolve much more rapidly than we do. Irrespective of what we do with our technology and stuff, their lifespans are short, their, their generational turnover is quick, their DNA drift is quick. They can respond much more rapidly than we can with our technology. If we vaccinate, in my opinion, all we are doing is handing that pathogen a genetic advantage. We are strengthening that pathogen artificially. Hmm. Okay. The sad fact is there are people who genetically are not predisposed to deal with and fight off certain pathogens. Those pathogens should kill those people. It sounds hard. It sounds inhuman, if you like, but this is a, a purely at a conceptual level. Okay. There are way, way, way too many human beings on this planet. It cannot support the number of human beings that are on it now. 
let alone the 10 billion that are expected to be here by the you know year 2025 or whatever whatever it is i can't even remember what year it was they said that was going to happen okay seven billion people is too many 10 billion is three billion more than that so it's three billion too many more again at some point this planet will throw us a readjustment curve okay and that will be in my opinion in the form of a pathogen that will wipe out a large number of us thus strengthening the gene pool of those that are left we may well be precipitating this our various selves by producing the super pathogen by increasing its rate of evolution by exponential factors by doing things like vaccinating which we believe to be we are undertaking as a good thing okay it's not a good thing it's folly we shouldn't be doing it just That's my theory pretty, pretty fascinating concept mm, just my theory yeah yeah i suspect part of the increase in autism might actually be a epigenetic response to the previous generation or even previous two generations alteration in diet you know with the mm. with the inclusion of more processed carbohydrates and seed oils and stuff like that it, i wonder if uh you know that partially explains why oh, look, my, my theory my theory is that that's entirely likely tom i i, I genuinely believe that that's entirely likely i think that the thing that people don't understand about our genes is that they are not instructions written on a stone tablet. They are a series of instructions which interact with the environment in which they find themselves. If then, if then, turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off. They are not just, here are the instructions, here are the 10 commandments for the human body. There's more than 10, obviously. There are hundreds of thousands, but... Um, yeah, th there is very much that if then, if then uh, process in play. So given that we are genetically designed, given that we genetically evolve, given that we are absolutely hunter, gatherer, opportunistic scavengers who are designed absolutely to survive almost entirely on animal flesh, with very, very small amounts of plant matter to support our subsistence when animals are not available. If we do something different to that, then we're going to be sparking off all sorts of things in our gene code that are going to be causing us all sorts of problems. Yeah. And yeah. You know, one of the, the interesting things that I come across, because I do listen to some of those ex vegan videos, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them move to the jungle so they can eat lots of fruit, you know, they move to tropical areas and then, mm -hmm. you know, they're always trying to trying to kick it up a notch because they don't feel good. So they try and eat the natural fruits, not the cultivated fruits, not the, the uh, fruits that have been, you know, improved and crossbred by human beings for hundreds of years. But yep. the actual native natural fruits and the un uh, every single time it comes up, they talk about how terrible they taste. Yeah. They're basically inedible. Yeah. So. yeah. It's, well, it's not that they're basically inedible. It's <laughs> they are inedible. They are not supposed to be eaten by human beings. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, I, I often say that I think when it comes to plant-based foods, it really comes down to how much an individual can tolerate, you know, it's like how much exactly right. how much yes. punishment your body could take, you know, some could take exactly. more than others, right? Yeah. So how do you explain the guys like Essendon that lived to over a hundred and only ate plants for 50 years or whatever? Well, number one, I don't believe that for one second. I, you know, that, that, that individual or any other individual was genuinely a hundred percent plant-based for that period of time. Um, and there are ways we could test that. Um, but we, you know, we, and, we, 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 you know, just not to throw a monkey wrench at it, but we had two, uh, two uh, women in our, in uh, you know, my extended family, who lived to be over a hundred years old, and they both ate at least a half a pound of bacon a day. 
It's not they just got, meat, not just fatty <laughs> meat, but cured meat, you know? Yeah, it's bacon even. Jeez. But, yeah. but surely, Tom, you know, half a rasher, half a rasher of bacon once in your life will kill you yesterday, isn't it? Yeah, it should it should have killed me before I was born. Apparently, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I you know, if if I actually took on board all the epidemiological stuff and all the risk factors about all the things that I've done in my life, I actually should have died in about seventeen ninety six. Yeah, uh, which would have been hundreds and hundreds of years before I was born. So there you go, right. <laughs> crazy stuff. Uh, you know, yeah, it's fascinating times that we find ourselves in um, as carnivores. We do find ourselves, I guess, in a discussion with others who have other ideologies around what is right, what is indicated, what will work in human beings, what won't work in human beings, um, what science even is, let alone what it says. And there is, for some reason, an incredibly emotive incredibly you know there's a lot of feeling in in the discussion the ongoing discussion around human nutrition and a lot of these ideologies come forward and there's a lot of um you know specifically bile i guess from from folks you know largely like the radical vegans not all vegans the radical ones i mean that that want to spit bile at us and want to call us all sorts of things and and try and discredit us with so-called science it's never going to work of course but um yeah we, we find ourselves in and it's not even a battle for the hearts and minds i guess of people because at the end of the day it's not actually my job to convince anybody of anything what i see my job as what i see my occupation as is offering the information and allowing people the opportunity to see the sense in what i'm saying to try it to see the results they're going to get and if they do that i don't you know I, as i say i've never come across a client yet that's gone you know that was a mistake i shouldn't have done that you made things worse by telling me that i've, I've never had a client say that to me every single time there's been an improvement and indeed usually it's something that they didn't even think about yeah you, know, you know what i used to always have such and such a situation and now i don't and i just thought it was normal let alone the obvious ones, the, the the vastly improved digestive function, the the psoriasis is gone, the fibromyalgia is gone, the chronic headaches are gone, the distress is gone, the anxiety is gone, whatever it is. You know, it, uh, this is just something that people need to take on face value at some point in your life. Look, let's say I've got this wrong. Let's say I'm completely mistaken about my interpretation of the physiology and the science. Let's say an all animal based, high fat, moderate protein, zero carbohydrate nutritional approach is wrong and would cause you problems in the long in the long run. Okay. You're not going to kill yourself in four weeks, are you? No. Try it. See what happens. And then give it another month. And if there's no sign of any problem, maybe give it a third month. Just yeah. do it month by month. It's like they say with the alcoholics, just do, just go day by day, you know? Maybe you're a carboholic. Maybe you're a fruitaholic. Maybe you're a pseudoscienceaholic. You know? Whatever it is, just try this thing for four bloody weeks. You will never look back. Okay? I've been doing this now for nearly eight months. Um pim has been on board for nearly eight weeks. People like Sean Baker have been doing it for a number of years. People like Frank Tufano are six and a half years into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Michaela's been doing this a couple of years, you know, so she should have died about 18 months ago from scurvy. Um, Sean Baker shouldn't be setting world records for rowing machine activity at 50-something years of age. That shouldn't be happening. He should have died from scurvy. Yeah, yeah, the dude's a beast. I yeah. went down there to see that rowing competition because it's not that far from where I live. Mm. And uh, what, what I 
the when I uh, I saw him, I was pretty sure I saw him, but then I was like, man, he a little shorter than I thought. And then I realized the guy who was standing next to was like seven feet tall. Yeah. <laughs> Sean yeah. is the, the impressive specimen because yeah. I think he's six five, and he is just. He's not real bulky, but he is clearly muscle from head to toe. Oh yeah, and yeah. Uh, the explosive power he had on that that rowing machine was uh, was something else. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an impressive uh, event. Yeah. So. Hey, so for anyone that doesn't know, um, I spoke to Sean and Zach a few days ago for the Human Performance Outliers podcast. It's actually episode 110, for those that don't know. Um, it's not available free of charge yet. It's it's still behind a paywall because that's the way that uh, that Sean and Zach do things, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, but it will come out soon for those who, well, if you want to see it now, go and you know subscribe to that. Uh, if you want to wait, uh, I guess, a couple of weeks, that'll be available. Uh, that was a great a great interview that the three of us had. I, I think we covered it. Was. I really enjoyed it. It was very good. And I'm not just sucking up to you because you were podcasting together. Fair <laughs> enough, too. <laughs> yeah, no, I, th I think we covered a lot of ground. So uh, yeah. you're well worth a look. Um, well worth a look, I would say. Yeah, Zach's a great guy, too. I emailed yes, him yes. here and there, and uh, he really is a good guy. He knows his stuff. Yeah, he's smart like a monkey. Yeah, but he's not. He's an he's a he's an ultra marathon runner. So as, yeah. as much as that, he, he's fucking crazy, basically. Yeah, it's insane with this. Why anyone would want to do that? I, said, I, like, do that, I have no idea. You're mad, completely mad. Um, yeah. But hey, like, you know you've got to respect it. This is a guy that can run a hundred miles in one hit. What the hell? He could he could he could run from where he lives in Phoenix probably to L.A. if he had to where I live. Yep. Right, he could run right down the freeway. That just blows my mind. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. <sighs> I do have one more burning question. All righty. Can you buy a Tasmanian devil at the pet store? No, you can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, for those uh, that, that don't have their geography fully squared away, uh, Tasmania is a part of Australia. It's little island that's what's well, not even that little really but it's the island at the, at the bottom of australia on the on the eastern seaboard uh in terms of it's it's line on the earth i guess it's it's pretty much in line with with new zealand here that's a similar climate they have a similar sort of uh, vegetation a similar sort of beauty and uh, for those that haven't seen new zealand it's a beautiful beautiful country you need to get here just for a look even if you're not going to come here permanently um but yeah, Tasmanian devils are a sort of a, a, a kind of animal that's that's a little bit endangered. They're they're um, yeah, you can't go and buy them in the pet store, unfortunately. No, maybe black market, right? Well, I probably could get one on the black market, but I'd, I'd I'd be against that. They are an endangered species, like many mm. species are, I guess these days. Um, okay. Yeah, no, that they're. Uh, I don't think they'd make great pets anyway. They're very aggressive, very scratchy, very you know very bitey sort of animals anyway they're not we have we have another strange animal like that that's not near as well known as the tasmanian devil and it's called a javelina okay. and it's it's a mix between a rat and a wild boar <laughs> they're freakish looking they have, okay yeah. fair enough and i always wondered if they were genetic cousins like you know, oh, I don't know. we have one off. down here and we have one down here in new zealand uh, it's called a drop bear D R O P B E A R drop bear. Oh yeah. Um, they don't actually exist, Tom. We made them up to scare, ah. scare tourists and ships. Hello, listen. If you're going out in the bush, especially at night, just be very careful. Um, drop bears are everywhere. They live in the trees. You walk under the tree, they'll drop on you. It's all over, Red Rover. <laughs> um, we actually do have possums here, which are an Australian import, or opossums. They're actually called. They're a marsupial that that lives in the trees and actually destroys the native bush and and you know causes all sorts of problems we, we've spent over the years probably millions and millions and millions of dollars on trying to eradicate the bastards um not just because they're australian but you know because they're causing a problem <laughs> we um, actually have a lot of possums where i live right okay there you go so you know about possums yeah we do have those 
but um yeah they don't generally tend to drop on you and cause you a problem so drop bears if you've ever if you ever heard the term down here in, in australasia look out for the drop bears don't be sucked in they don't exist mm. Bullshit. <laughs> yeah we have a uh, habit of uh perpetuating this myth about snipe hunting here i don't know if you have that one but you take people out snipe hunting at night because they only come out at night and of course they just don't exist yeah snipes <laughs> <laughs> good luck yeah. oh well as usual tom it's been an absolute pleasure today my friend um i'm grateful to you for putting the time aside so that we could you know sort of have this discussion um it was it was great um likewise i really appreciate the time and the effort and i look forward to doing it doing this again with you as i think we have great conversations i think uh yeah, yeah. people will get something out of it you know yeah, I hope so too. And listen, any of my people who are not, you know, already followers of Tom's very fantastic channel, make sure you get over there and sub to that. Uh, and also support the group on Facebook, the Autistic Carnivores group. It's a great group that Tom's put together there, a bunch of like-minded people. Um, we'll even let you sign up if you're not autistic, won't we, Tom? Yeah, that uh, family <laughs> members, clinicians. You know, there's a lot of people that are curious. A lot of people that that work with autistic people in there and stuff like that. So yeah, so get over there, get subbed. You know, let's support each other. Let's get things rocking and rolling. Absolutely, um, get the and, word you know, out. Get the word out there that actually, you know, it's 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 not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to, you know, we you know. Autistic people play their role in society just like anybody else. And, um, yeah, as I say, I appreciate the opportunity to to be able to talk to to a fellow autist, for want of a better term, and, and to yeah. discuss these things and, and to helpfully hope, hopefully help those um, who, you know, don't perhaps have a full understanding to to increase their level of understanding. And, and uh, if you can help out someone uh, that does experience some autistic spectrum tendencies and things, so much the better. Mm. Absolutely. Anything to improve the quality of life of the individuals and the people that, that care about them, you know? Mm. Yep, absolutely. And uh, and don't don't eat plants, okay? I'm good. Yeah, avoid the plants plant. are bad. Mm, good. Mm -hmm. good. All right. Been a pleasure, All Tom. Right. Thanks, Thanks again, much, man. And, uh, you know, thank you. And we will see you again real soon. Yep. I'll, I'll see you online at the very least. You will, for sure. All right, buddy. Take care. It's out of him. I hope I will. All right, buddy.